Hello, and welcome to this month's episode of Money Mountaineering with Peter Newarth. We are so excited to have Michael Edisis, author of The Big Investment Lie and The Three Simple Rules of Investing, talking to us tonight from Hong Kong. We're going to hear all about that. Our topic is how, how this accomplished mathematician and economist sees the world. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm the producer of the show on Incandescent Radio and Incandescent TV. Pete is just one of my dearest clients. So take it away, sir. All right. Well, thanks very much, Hope. And and thank you, Michael, for 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 joining me. I mean, this is this is really an, an honor and a thrill to have uh, have you who are who are a really truly accomplished mathematician and economist and almost an actuary from what I understand before you decided it was, I don't know what, but um, I'm glad, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you've done what you've done throughout the last 50 years or so. And um, I'd like to start at the beginning because um, back in this, back in the seventies um, there were a lot of investment uh, houses that uh, went looking for theoretical mathematicians like yourself to um, solve the markets or perhaps bring the bring the mathematical tools to bear on making markets more tractable and potentially m minimizing or maybe even eliminating risk while maximizing return. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out that way, but Michael, can you tell us a little bit about those those years and and how you started and why it didn't work out okay well uh, thanks pete it's my pleasure thank you very much for inviting me um okay well you're asking me to go back to my first uh, uh um <clears throat> I, I the problem will be to keep this short uh so i had gotten my uh, phd in pure mathematics there was also an applied mathematics department at the university, and we didn't talk to them because uh, they were in the real world and we wanted to be in the abstract world and we wanted never to have an application. Uh, and this was because it was during the Vietnam War and it seemed that all the applications of technology were being used for uh, uh, war uh, development of military uh, uh, equipment, bombs, and so forth. Um, so um, when a, um, a guy in my uh, fellow graduate student said to me, you know, you might want to try this uh, brokerage firm, A.G. Becker, they're, they're doing interesting things with mathematics. I thought, well, okay, I'll go <clears throat> have an interview. The interviewer said, well, I don't know anything about what, you, you know, I don't know what you're, doing, but maybe uh, I, don't, I don't know anything about mathematics. Anyway, they hired me right away. And uh, I'd actually like to strangle that guy who said uh, they're doing interesting things with mathematics, because this was simply not true. The The mathematics I found <clears throat> was very low quality, not really relevant to any uh, application, particularly not to investment. In fact, I told uh, a friend, a fellow graduate student in math, uh, after I had been to a couple of conferences where, you know, every presentation had some math or what looked like math in it. And I told a friend, I said, you know what, either these people want to be mathematicians or they want to have do something that has a practical application. If they want to be mathematicians, they're going to have to do a whole lot better math. But if they want to actually have a practical application, this is not it. Mm -hmm. This this math that they're they, they they pretend to be applying does not do what people think it does. I mean, there's sort of <clears throat> there's a, there's a new word that I hear, I start hearing over and over and over again. And I really like this word. The word is performative. It's uh, you, you do something performatively to make it look like you're doing something, not to actually do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this this was essentially what applied to the mathematics. It was 
performative, but I think they didn't realize it because they didn't they didn't know any better in the in this uh, finance field. So that that's that's what happened when I got into it. And I wound up uh, uh, debating uh, speakers. So I I as I I I first uh, started out from the from the audience. Uh, 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 picking bones with Bill Sharp as he was presenting, who, by the way, I don't, I, I don't hold him responsible for any of this. And in fact, he's he's kind of a friend now. We, uh, and then I was asked to debate <clears throat> the proposition the capital asset pricing model has no practical value uh, mm -hmm. at the uh, University of Chicago CRISP convention in October 1973. And that was that was a very enjoyable uh, 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 experience. Uh, so, but it but it did not present it did not prevent uh, your employer and and others in the field from um, making representations about what the math um, demonstrated and taking those representations out to clients. Right? No, not at all. No, I I mean I. I... <laughs> I remember a couple of times they would the, the these uh, uh, Becker had these people they called consultants, but they were basically salesmen. They sold <clears throat> they sold this book full of statistics, all the same statistics shown in graph after graph after graph, but they were the same, just different graphs. And they were about where your pension fund, because most of the clients were pension funds or endowment fund or whatever. Uh, where your uh, fund's investment performance rate of return stood uh, among all of those that uh, uh, Becker had data on. And uh, it showed whether it was in the first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, or fourth quartile. And they sold this book full of statistics for $20,000. Mm -hmm. And when I first learned that, I thought, oh, I must be hearing things. This, this can't be. But this was because of the directed brokerage of the era. The brokerage rates were fixed and very high. Mm -hmm. And so there was an automatic profit, but there was competition to get uh, the brokerage directed to your brokerage firm. So uh, it, just like airlines did before the airline prices were deregulated, they would offer perks. And then and in exchange for the perk, you would agree to direct a certain amount of brokerage. So the the twenty thousand dollars was uh, not a real well, it was a real number in a sense because they would direct twenty thousand dollars worth of uh, brokerage to A. G. Becker in exchange for getting this book full of statistics and graphs. Uh, now, so, now, so so this this went on for quite some time before you you finally decided to tr try to bust everybody and, and write your, your book about the, the big investment lie. But before we get to the big investment lie, I, I'm just curious why you think the, the, the narrative didn't fall apart based on, you know, real life reality meeting the, um, all of these theoretical um, representations. Well, I suppose the reality that you're talking about is that uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a quote. Since you mentioned the, the the big investment lie, I will. This may be uh, not. Uh, this may be too self indulgent, but uh, I, when I wrote this, I like this quote, and this is true. If you go to a library or if you go and crack open a journal in in the finance field, you find lots of mathematics in it. So my quote is sauntering through. The expensive, glossy outputs of the professional investment field, you may glimpse arcane, sophisticated sounding articles suggesting the discourses of an elite court of exquisitely knowledgeable experts. Yet, in spite of the self serving message trumpeted to both insiders and outsiders by these arcana, we insiders are smart and extraordinarily capable. The actual fact is that professional investors do not do better than the random investment picks of a gaggle of monkeys. And this is absolutely true. Let me give you the most astounding example of this. This, this will not be believed, but it's absolutely true. The biggest 
university endowment funds, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and so forth, have underperformed the market over the last 20 years by about 1.5% a year. Now, 1.5% may not sound like a lot, but over sounds, 20 years... Sounds that like lose... just, about, just about equal to their investment fees, actually. Exactly, exactly. Now, the, the loss of 1.5% a year compared to what you could have done means the loss of about 40% of your gains over 20 years. So these funds run by professionals, very highly paid professionals, with presumably access to all the, the Nobel Prize winners in economics at their universities, have underperformed the market by 1.5% a year, which, as you mentioned, is exactly the fees that they paid, 1.5% a year in fees on average. Now, let's just take Harvard. Harvard has a $50 billion endowment. 1.5% of $50 billion is $750 million that Harvard pays using the, the money of their donors, mm -hmm. their tuition-paying students, to buy utterly worthless investment services. $750 million goes to buying worthless services. And you can be sure that all the money managers they hire, sometimes they hire as many as 100, are the kinds of people who go to these conferences that I went to where bogus mathematics is presented. So this, this is the, um, as you mentioned, the, you know, it's not true. M Milton Friedman thought, and you can watch videos, and he has good point, that corporations could regulate themselves because if the consumer, the customer, didn't like what they offered, or if it turned out to be a defective product, the customer would simply not buy that product. Well, you know, um, you're, um, you know, it's, it's so great that you, you actually pulled a quote that I had underlined um, that I was going to ask you about. But on the very next page, you also perhaps explain a little bit of this when you say, uh, when you quote uh, Streetcar Named Desire and how um, Blanche Dubois says, I don't want reality, I want magic. And isn't that really what's, what we're, we're up against is that the investing public and the people that are out there tr struggling with what to do with their money and where to put it they want a magic answer. Yeah. Let, let me give you another uh, example. I, I have a friend who um, made quite a bit of money. I, my guess is that he's in the, you know, maybe not a hundred million uh, net worth, but, but, but not much less than that. <clears throat> he plays a lot of golf. Mm -hmm. He actually, I have to, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to him because he volunteered to read as I was writing the big investment lie and to comment on it. So he was he was helpful. But he invested in hedge funds. And I uh, said to him, you, you shouldn't invest in hedge funds. And he said, every time I invest in hedge funds, I lose money. But <laughs> one time, one time he said, Oh, I'm going to go meet my hedge fund uh, representative, you want to join us. So I joined him and, and the, the guy who was politically well connected. Uh, and they just kind of shot the bull. They didn't talk about investment at all. My friend, I said, I told you, plays a lot of golf. He had this kind of look like, oh, what can I do? I know why. Because on the golf course, what are they going to talk about? He's he's playing golf with other wealthy individuals with e extra money to invest. And somebody's going to ask him, so what do you invest in? And if he says, I invest in the uh, Vanguard Total Market Index Fund, they're going to say, what? <laughs> that, that, that actually happened to me once. When, when we started Lockwood, we got uh, uh, investment money from Tony O'Reilly, an Irish billionaire and, and uh, formerly a, a star rugby player and then the uh, president of the Heinz Corporation. So smart guy. And, but he, he, he 
put his son in as the the board member of the the company that he helped us start by investing uh, a substantial amount of money in the company. And his son asked me that same question. His son was 28 years old. He asked me that question, what do you invest in? And I said, index funds. And he said, what? I mean, just like that. <laughs> he said, you, you know so much, you're so smart, you invest in index funds? Well, that's my friend Bill doesn't want to be shamed on the golf course. Well, I guess I guess in that in that sense also the the emperor has no clothes is a, is another way of of putting it. But um, I want to move from that to um, to to something actually you, you took you took a little bit of issue in my book appropriately I think where and and it actually wasn't said by me it was it was said by somebody else but it was a it was a quote of a study that says that 401k investors do worse when they manage their own money than professionally managed, um, uh, or actually do better than professionally managed um, funds. Now, is that really true? That um, because you, you see these, these studies quoted that, that individuals trying to manage their own money just can't beat the pros. Um, what does the data show? I, I have not seen anything that shows that people managing their own money can't beat the pros. I I, I don't think that's true, <clears throat> and I, I I've never seen anything that that uh, purports to show that it is true. Although I'm sure that there are such studies because there are thousands and thousands of studies, and there are many that are conjured up. Uh, but but I haven't seen any uh, any any. So you uh, think it might be study. just a just cherry picking in order to pull uh, pull some um, um, impressive sounding um, um, support for the for the notion that you should give your money over to a professional manager as opposed to deciding well, sure. Your well sure yeah okay well, well the, the particular uh, <clears throat> quote that uh, in your book, which was not yours, it was it was uh, you 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 actually uh, uh, it was actually from a reputable uh, person who unfortunately didn't didn't know what had been discovered, wow. which was that this company uh, called Dalbar <clears throat> had been getting away with for now. Pro I think they're probably they're still going. That's uh, I, so it's maybe thirty years getting away with doing simply. Are completely wrong mathematics, uh, arithmetic. I mean, it's 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 that simple. To and they claim it shows that quote unquote investors underperform their investments, and the implication is that is they time the market badly. Mm -hmm. They they sell after a drop. Uh, they buy after the market has risen, and that sounds like it would necessarily time the market badly but mm -hmm. um but the um, this 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 myth basically arose from dalbar doing uh calculating the rate of return wrong in, ah. in such a, in such a way that it, it had to show a very substantial gap between the return on on an investment like a mutual fund and the return that the investor in the mutual fund got but it's just due to a due to calculating rate of return completely wrong but then but but this myth that they managed to embed in this in this investor psyche and even the professional investor psyche lived on and Morningstar believed that it must be true. Many people believe that it must be true. Jack Bull thought it must be true. I, I could kind of debated with him about this a little bit uh, myself. It's the only thing that we ever had any disagreement about. Um, so, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I, I it's, it, it, you know, it's so supportive of my view that, People should take responsibility for their own investors and, and you know, get help when you need it. 
but really know when you need help. And a lot of times you think you may need help, you know, but in fact, if you, if you think the market is, you know, a place that you want to have your money, put your money in the market, but put it in an index fund where you get the market return and you don't have to rely on somebody picking stocks and trying to beat the market. Um, so. Right. Um, I, I think, I think the, uh, the only way that people do underperform the market, uh, investors, naive investors, all investors, professionally, they, all of them, they, the, the way that they do routinely underperform the market is by not being in the market all of the time. Mm -hmm. So the, be the best thing to do is to ignore the ups and downs, invest in an index fund, not look at the um, where the market is for like 30 years, I mean, depending on how old you are for, you know, but uh, typically people invest for accumulation at younger ages. And when they're investing for accumulation, the, the average time over which they're accumulating is at least 30 years. And so they should simply buy an index fund, ignore what it does completely in the interim, because if they do anything about it, they're likely to take their money out. And that's how they're going to in, underperform. Right, right. <laughs> so um, now, so we you talked a lot about um, how, you know, these, these professional firms in the Wall Street confuse people and get them to believe in magic. Um, one of the things that looks like magic to me is that this, this imaginary thing uh, or this, as as I saw uh, one uh, comic characterize it, is basically a number, which is that you own when you buy a Bitcoin, as opposed to something real, is worth 35, now I guess almost $40,000. What's what's involved in that magic? I mean, that's a, that's a true magic trick to get, to get just a set of numbers worth $40,000. Well, the, simple, the simplest explanation, of course, is bigger fool theory. Some 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 bigger fool will buy it from me for a, a higher amount, and that seems to hold good, although I think at this point you can't depend on a bigger fool because the price is already much higher than it, you know, if you had bought it in 2012, uh, you'd have a fortune now. And I, I think it's for that reason that there's a craze about it. People get the past and the future confused. They... Is, is it money? I mean, is it real money? Because it was supposed to change the definition of money, wasn't it? Yep. Okay. I So I taught, the, the, the as you mentioned, I taught the first... Uh, course on cryptocurrency in Hong Kong at the uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology Business School in 2017. I had a friend who kept babbling about Bitcoin. I had no idea what he was talking about, absolutely none. So I did something that I've done before several times. When I didn't know about something, I found I find that I'm not very good at taking a course because I my attention wanders. I'm not very good at reading. Well, the first time I did it, the topic was international finance. And I thought I ought to know much more about that than I did. So I got a first I thought about taking a class. I thought, no, that's not going to work. Then I got a book and a big fat book boring is geez, I, I said, I, I got it. I'll teach it. <laughs> and and of course I didn't know what it, I mean I, I was I was scrambling to stay ahead of the students. And I've done this several times. So I did it with cryptocurrency. I I, I, I volunteered to teach it. Uh, I think at the time, the finance department at HKUST was probably thinking, you know, suddenly we're hearing a lot about this. Maybe we need a course. And suddenly here's this guy offering to teach it. So they, they said to me, could you send a syllabus? And I thought, a syllabus? Yeah. <laughs> So I wrote one and they said, okay, this looks good. And I thought it does. 
but I, I taught it. So, so I know, I know what it's all about. Now, at first, I thought there was a, a real possibility that Bitcoin could take over as the international currency, mm -hmm. because there were an increasing number of merchants who were saying they accepted Bitcoin as payment. And I was thinking, well, one of them was Whole Foods. And I don't know exactly what they were accepting it for. I don't think they were accepting it for all purchases, but maybe coupons or something. And Amazon bought Whole Foods. And I thought, you know, if Amazon says that they're going to accept Bitcoin in payment for goods, the game's over. It will become the accepted currency alongside the dollar and maybe even replace the dollar. But then as I was teaching the course or as I was preparing to teach it, I discovered that there's a very low ceiling on how many transactions can be transacted with Bitcoin. Because of the limitations of this, uh, the blockchain, which is just a database designed for this particular purpose and that suddenly has become a big buzzword, but it's not a very capable database. And it's not capable of doing more than about seven transactions per second. Mm -hmm. And if it does that, the transactions become very expensive. You're competing to get included in the next block of transactions, approved transactions with other transactors. So it, it, it just won't work. And it it uh, it hasn't. There haven't been very many. It, and yet, it does seem to be um, used for, for illicit transactions and um, the 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 underworld and the in the dark net. It seems to be just rife with transactions that are conducted in Bitcoin. So, I mean, when I looked at it, I thought, well, maybe this is just the currency of the criminal class, and that. Just like any other other currency, you evaluate, well, how much is it worth by looking at, well, how big is that, you know, country's currency and how does that compare to the supply? And maybe you could, you know, come up with a kind of an exchange rate between, you know, this criminal uh, criminal currency and and other currencies. But um, but you don't think that it's even feasible for that kind of limited purpose. It, it is uh, useful for uh, for this underworld. Uh, and uh, the best way to see that very clearly is to read a book, which I, I, I read in parallel with uh, Michael Lewis's book about FTX and Sam Bankman-Fried. I think the, I think the title of the book is Number Go, Number Go Up or something like that by... Zeke Foe, or possibly Fox, I don't know how he pronounces it. And that that uh, book uh, follows, instead of FTX or Bitcoin, uh, Zeke Foe or Fox followed the uh, cryptocurrency called Tether, which is uh, uh, supposedly, um, uh, it, uh, it, it's a, a stable coin. That is to say, it retains its value relative to the dollars, supposedly pegged to the dollar. So it's equivalent to a dollar, supposedly. It's not really well back. You can't really trust it, but it's been surviving as he shows for many years. Um, it is used and it doesn't, you know, the problem with the illicit transactions is that most of the Bitcoin was invented to supposedly decentralize the process of transacting in money and to take it away from centralized institutions like big banks. Mm -hmm. But inevitably, and this, this happens in, in many things, centralization kind of just, it, it just sets in. So right. FTX was a centralized. Right cryptocurrency exchange and right. you couldn't exchange uh fiat currency like us dollars for 
Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency on that exchange without telling them who you are. So it's all completely traceable. Right. But te Tether doesn't trade. It probably does, but it, 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 most of it wasn't trading on a centralized cryptocurrency exchange. So it's very hard to trace. And in, in Zeke Fo's book, I was astounded to see what it was being used for, being used for uh, uh, human trafficking in the sense that People are enticed to apply for jobs and then they're hired and then they're basically shut in to places with bars in Cambodia where they're forced <laughs> to do things like sell cryptocurrencies over the phone. Uh -huh. But they're but they're basically imprisoned. Right. Uh, it's just just astounding. Well, I was uh, you know, I was very taken by your review of uh, Michael Lewis's book and uh um, and and um, I wonder, are there lessons to be learned from the Sam Bankman um, experience? I mean, what what um, I mean, you seem very down on the whole notion of crypt of of Bitcoin, but I mean, does crypto have a place in the future? And what what can we learn from that whole experience? Well, first of all, let me uh, I I. I... I said something uh, along about this to somebody recently. I can't remember what what the conversation was about, uh, and they seemed surprised because they they said, "Well, oh, the the CFO of uh, of Hong Kong, the uh, uh, what forget his title, uh, was talking to me the other day, and he said he thinks that this uh, cryptocurrency is really going to be a big deal." And I, I I said, "Really?" And then later I thought. Wait a minute. I think what he said confused because what he was probably talking about was the national uh, digital currency, mm -hmm. which which China is experimenting with, and other countries are experimenting with. That those aren't cryptocurrencies, right? They, they right. bear no resemblance to cryptocurrencies. But I think. People confuse them with a cryptocurrency. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's that that's part of this whole dematerialization of money. I mean, you know, money's gotten, you know, used to be big chunks of gold that you'd have to carry to to buy a house, and then it got smaller and easier to carry, and then now it's paper money, and then now it's just electrons on a on a on a ledger sheet. So. Um, but I think you're right. I think it's it's that's a fundamentally a very different. Uh, trend, which may, you know, not stop uh, that um, uh, versus versus crypto, which is a which is a whole different thing. So so we're just about out of time. So I wanted to to know if you could sort of, I mean, clearly you're a little bit uh, skeptical of uh, you know expert advice as to where to put your money, but. For the for the person that's out there struggling with how to get by, how to live on their 401k uh, balance, or maybe their 401k and the the equity in their home, and maybe they got social security, maybe the thing. What kind of advice would you have for them in terms of how to manage your money going forward? Well, you know the the advice uh, for people that are, are struggling with their finances is advice that, of course, anybody can give. And, of course, anybody will find hard to take. And it's, you know, basically uh, pulling, you know, tighten your belt. You, you, you know, don't, don't overspend so that you have to get loans because over time you, it would just make things worse. And uh, tighten your belt enough so that you can save 10%, 15% of your annual intake every year and put it in an index fund, uh, assuming that you're not going to use it. Well, you must assume that you're putting this away and you're not going to use it for years. Right. In, well, that's, which, I mean, that works during the accumulation phase. It's the decumulation phase where which many of us are, are now entering where it becomes challenging. And I think what you said is, is, is really very, you know, 
consistent with what I've been always saying, which is that fundamentally living in retirement is a, it's an asset liability matching problem or a cash flow matching. You've got your future cash flow needs and your future cash flow coming in. And too many people focus on where to put your assets and how to how to make that the money come in and not enough on what are the, what are the liabilities and what am I going to owe and what am I going to need this money for and how do I make those two uh, consistent? So yes, yes, and it's not it's the decumulation phase is is complicated by, by the fact that there are all these uh, these alternatives like annuities. An annuity is a, is a, is a good idea. Uh, um, uh, but people don't like the idea that they it's it's locked up they can't well it's it's longevity insurance is what it is and and it's yeah. i mean again i mean I, I i talk about the risks in decumulation how do you mitigate them well one of the best ways to address a risk is to insure against it and fortunately there are products like annuities that you know give you pure longevity insurance now there's there's um there's not a lot of other pure insurances like that for a lot of the other risks, but um, you know, there's, yeah. there's some. Yeah. So yeah. But by the way, I I, I want to uh, uh, correct what I said about becoming an actuary because I I I, I sensed a little bit of disappointment in you uh, about that. I didn't want to do that. Well, I was already doing something else and I really <laughs> didn't, I didn't want to be in any financial field at all. I really wanted to be in what I thought I was going to do in the first place, which was some kind of technology and finally did. did. I threw over, I took more than 80% drop in, in uh, right. uh, pay to go into solar energy research. But, uh, but, but I do want to say that the, the best math is done by actuary. So this this uh, one of my articles. Uh, I think you I think you mentioned it. Uh, points out that th there are I don't know possibly hundreds of articles written about rebalancing in the finance journals, and they're all I mean they're just I don't want to use you know I don't want to use a four letter word, but they they're they're just garbage. You know they're all they 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 do some math and then they say this shows that, and no it do it does not. The math does does not show what they conclude. This the 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 uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics, Paul Romer, who by the way is the the, the son of the governor of Colorado, who, whom I knew, um, the former governor of Colorado. Uh, but uh, he, he calls this mathiness. It's it sounds it sounds like it looks like math, but it isn't really quite. It's you know, <laughs> but it feels right. Feels right. Feels like it must imply this thing that I already believed, even though it doesn't. So anyway, all these articles in the finance journals about rebalancing, I haven't found one yet that's mm -hmm. any good. The, the the best one was by Bill Bernstein, but it but it was wrong. But it was wrong for subtle reasons, uh, and it wasn't even in a finance journal. But then I discovered an article that was absolutely right about rebalancing, hardly ever referenced in any finance journal article. And it was in an actuarial journal. Well, we, and it was we, it was excellent, this article. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I mean, I really appreciate the uh, the support and endorsement for for our 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 industry, because I, I I do believe in actuarial science and I think um but it's it's wonderful to 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 get you know real mathematicians like you to and, and again I, I I I do consider actuarial actuaries, real mathematicians, just applied mathematicians as opposed to um, pure right. mathematicians. So, um, but I really, right. really appreciate you coming on there. And it's been just a joy to to hear your insights and um, best of luck to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Pete. And uh, hope to be in touch again uh, yes. soon. Thank you, gentlemen, for such a fascinating, wonderful conversation all the way from Hong Kong. It's 8 a.m. or 8.48 there now, and it's 8.48 p.m. where I am, and Pete is three hours behind in Cali, so it's very cool to be so international with you all and having these high-powered conversations uh, for pe lay people like myself and others. We really uh, love the insight, even if we don't understand the details. So <laughs> thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Pete. Thank you to our audience. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, producer of the show. You are listening to Money Mountaineering with actuary and author Peter Newarth and our wonderful guest tonight, 
Michael S's. Say your name for me, Michael. Michael Edis's. Did I say it right? That's right. Edis's. Okay. That's as I as I said. That's what they told me. <laughs> okay, Michael Edis is an accomplished math mathematician and economist, author of The Big Investment Lie and The Three Simple Rules of Investing. So thank you all. Stay tuned for another episode of Money Mountaineering next month. We look forward to seeing you. Take good care.